Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to do something a little different this morning. Before we do that, how about the praise team? We were set literally 15 minutes before 9 o'clock for an acoustic worship set. So we had everything ready to go down here. Let's give those guys a round of applause. Let's... So Rick asked Mandy and I, if you haven't met my beautiful wife and my far better half, uh, this is Mandy, he asked us today to speak with you about being with God every day, being in his presence. A book we read many years ago, Celebration of Discipline, is, is just a little touch of what we're talking about today, but it's, it's seeking God for who he is. Um, so we've got a lot of scriptures today that's going to talk about that, and we're kind of going to do sort of a back and forth because, truthfully, without Mandy, I wouldn't be able to be the complete version of who God is making me to be. Her example of study, her example of prayer, her lifting me up in prayer, and she's going to talk about this 18, 19 years ago, changed everything for us. So... I'm going to turn it over to you for a little bit. How's that sound? Well, um, I grew up in a Christian home, but I don't think I knew that I really needed Christ until our oldest son was um, about four, and we had the jobs and the kid and the dogs and the marriage and the house and everything. But and a very defiant, not. strong-willed child, I'll add. <laughs> no, yes. Uh, <laughs> But it wasn't going very well, and wasn't going well at all. And the word divorce was being thrown around a lot in our house. And um, I knew I needed, I had parents who read their Bibles every day and made me go to church whether I wanted to or not. And so I had that um, foundation to fall back on, and I knew that that had to become real for me, or that this marriage and and our raising of our son was not going to be at all what I thought it was going to be. And bear in mind, I came from a non-Christian home. I came from a home where the only time I went to worship uh, was when I stayed the night at Les and Carol Johnson's house, as I've shared with many of you before. And so that was my experience with Christianity uh, before we started dating. So, so um, I came to a Bible study here at Fifth Avenue called Lies Women Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. And I started trying to read the Bible um, to see what my role was as a wife and a mom. You know, what was that supposed to look like in God's plan? And that's when God's word really started to come alive to me and became something that I needed um, daily. So I just wanted to share a little of that with you because the last thing I want anyone to think about Jeremiah or I is that we just must have it all figured out. Like we've just been perfect since the morning we were born and you know it's been easy all along and that is not true. And it still isn't a lot of days, so. Uh, if you need proof of that, she's married to me, so. <laughs> so did you wanna do the, want me to ask that first question? Yeah, so Mandy kind of was preparing for this this week, and so she came up with some questions. Um, so question number one that she came up with is, is why, why is the study and prayer and being in God's Word every day such a big deal? So you probably all know about me that we're, we work in public schools, and we love that. That's our mission field, um, and so we're very much in the world. <laughs> Um, and so what I, what I see and what I live is that the world, our, our view of God can and will be shaped by the world if we're not in the word. It, if we're not looking to God to tell us who he is, then the world will tell us who he is. So I have some options I came up with. <laughs> and on different days, you might see God as one of these different options. And Jeremiah has another one he'll want to talk to you about. But one thing that I see um, out there, and I sometimes slip into believing myself, is that God is some mean and judgmental, um, disconnected God who is opposed to everything fun. And if I allow myself to listen to the world, then I'll see God in that sort of disapproving, negative way. Um, another thing that I see a lot from the world is that God is my co-pilot. 
and then I get to drive, and God is some vague spiritual being sitting there by me, just patting me on the shoulder and telling me I'm doing a great job. Just keep doing what I'm doing. I'm, you know, I'm, I, got the, I got the wheel. Um, another thing that I think the world tells us is that um, God is, this one, this one scares me a little bit, that God is irrelevant, um, that he's an outdated um, sort of disconnected, old-fashioned idea that at best is just quaint and at worst is uh, closed-minded and dangerous and I think that one that idea of God being irrelevant makes my stomach sick <laughs> so I that one makes me uncomfortable when you think of that one the, the way I picture it Mandy said you know one of the concepts of God is on your you know, behind you, just patting you on the back and saying, well, it's okay, you're doing fine. This one gives me the picture of the world telling you, well, it's okay, honey, if you want to believe in God, go ahead, if that's what makes you feel better. Because isn't that the sentiment we see often in the world today, that if that comforts you and helps you sleep at night, then do it. There is danger in picturing God in any of those ways. And one more, just kind of tied into what Jeremiah just said is, um, that God is a myth that was created by feeble and weak-minded people who couldn't hack it otherwise. And they needed something, you know, that, because we're, we're apparently, you know, I think the world sometimes thinks that if we believe, we just are living with our heads in the sand and ignoring the reality of the world. And that's the exact opposite of who God shows us to be in the person of Jesus Christ. Because if ever there was anyone who knew the ugliness of the world, it was Christ. And Jeremiah had another one that I thought was really important. One of the things that I struggle with um, in, in my role in the schools, um, I deal with pretty much the negative things that happen in a school. I deal with uh, poor behavior, kids who have terrible home lives and struggle, uh, kids who don't show up to school. I deal with every emergency situation that arises. That's my role. If you have uh, something that shouldn't be in a school or a shooter in the school, that, that's my job. Um, and so it feels on days like I teeter back and forth by either God isn't big enough to do the things that I have to do today um, to I'm not sure I'm equipped to do this job today. I'm not sure that I'm enough to do the job today. Um, I'm not really sure some days that that Holy Spirit we preached about last week is, is he really here? Am I really ready for the things that I have to get done and the service I do every day? So those are, those are things that as I look around and, you know, you feel helpless and hopeless at times. Um, those are struggles. And then if you want to really complicate the situation, most of us see God as an all of the above. <laughs> If you can imagine that, that we kind of take ingredients of all of those things and mishmash it up into some very big, confusing mess until we're, we kind of look at our Bible on the shelf and we're like, I don't, I don't even know. I can't. I don't, I'm so confused. So um, I asked Noah to, to play that song, Reckless Love, today because God is so much more and so much bigger than anything we could ever understand by one reading or by one retreat or by one sitting down um, to get serious with the Bible. But he is outside of the box. Every time we try to put him in one, it doesn't work out very well. And he, um, he, wants, to get, he wants us to discover him our whole lives. So opening that word constantly, it's going to be different. It's, we're going to discover new things all the time. So that song, Reckless Love, it's a little bit uncomfortable because when we think of the word reckless, we don't think of God. Here's my thought. Um, God isn't reckless. But the way he loves, to our human understanding, looks reckless because it's so big. It's so outside of the box. It's so far beyond what we could ever do that when we look at the way God loves, we go, what? No one can do that. That's not possible. No, not for us. It is not possible. It's only possible for him. So 
we talked about a couple of stories out of the Bible that we thought we might just share little snippets of, just as little pictures of this kind of love that we discover when, when we find those places in the Bible that maybe we didn't learn about in Sunday school, or maybe we just have never encountered before, and God just, they just kind of explode in front of our eyes as this new vision of him, and it changes everything. It changes us. So one of the ones that has been a big, big one for me, and I've seen it be a big one for a lot of women, is the story of Hosea and Gomer. And it's not, it's not a Sunday school story, and it's not one that we probably turn to all the time. It's an Old Testament prophet who lived at the same time as Isaiah and Amos and Micah. Um, and God called Hosea to marry Gomer, who was either a prostitute or an adulteress. And God was very clear with Hosea, she's not going to be faithful to you, but I want you to love her, and I want you to marry her, right? Reckless. Like, this is not a human. We cannot understand this as a human. Um, but Hosea was faithful and obedient, and he married Gomer. They had three children. The Bible's fairly clear that those probably weren't Hosea's children, but he treated them as though they were. Um, and at some point, she, she left him to go back to her old way of life because she missed the lifestyle, she missed the money, she missed the, the alcohol, <laughs> the drink, the, the gifts. Um, and he let her go. And then um, he did try to provide for her even then. Again, like how do we understand that kind of love? He still knew where she was. He knew who she was with. He provided money. He provided ways for her to be cared for. And then at some point, he just stopped. He stopped. And it got hard for her. She couldn't, nobody wanted to be with her. They didn't want to buy her those gifts anymore. And when she was at her lowest point, being sold as a slave, um, she heard a voice from the crowd buying her. And it was her husband. This is not a picture of God that we're very comfortable with. This is not something in society that we would say, that is, watch that model for marriage. <laughs> but God, God gives us that picture and he let that play out so that he could show his people the kind of love that he has for them. And this is not the new covenant either. This is the Old Testament God. Bear in mind, according to God's law, she should have been stoned publicly, executed, if you will. Um, to us, that looks reckless. It looks like Hosea should have been hopeless. It looks like he should have felt that he wasn't enough, and there was nothing he could do, and he didn't have the strength. But God gives us him uh, this picture of God's love in a way that in the Old Testament had to be shocking. It's, it's a picture almost before Jesus saying things like, you know, if your enemy slaps you, let him slap the other side too. If, if he tells you to walk a mile, go another. It was before all of that was given that God's love was really, truly shown. Is this for our second Corinthians? Oh, prodigal son. See, I'm a mosquito. I tell you guys that every week, right? The other story of God's love that always speaks to me is the story that Jesus tells of the prodigal son, and I think it's the worst named story in the Bible. That's my own personal opinion because it's really not a story about the son. It's really a story about the father, and you know the story. Rick shared it a few weeks ago. Younger son goes to his father, asks for his share of the inheritance. Do you know what the younger son was actually do? Pretty much nothing. A mere fraction of the total, probably less than 10% was what that son should have gotten, and yet that wasn't what his father did. What did he do? He gave him his half. That wasn't law. The younger son goes and squanders it, lives with the pigs. For a good Jewish boy, living and feeding pigs is probably the most detestable thing that could be done. Lives his wild life, and you think, well, that should be about the son, right? But all the while, what's happening the story talks about the father who sees his son far off, 
what does that imply? What was the father doing while the son was gone? He was looking, and he never stopped. Then there's this picture of the father, who's a wealthy, wealthy man, highly esteemed in his community. He's got servants. He's got all of these things at his command. But what does the father do? He doesn't say, hey, go, go pick up my son there and, and bring him to me. Instead, he hikes up his robe, exposing his bottom part of his body, which was not the thing to do. He hikes it up, and he runs. The father himself runs to the son. And then he hugs him and kisses him. Now what's significant about that? Well, the son had been with pigs. The son was ceremonially ceremonially unclean, and the father therefore made himself unclean. Exposing all of that filth to his very own body. And then he goes farther. And he says, "Get him my purple robe, the robe of royalty of um, importance, the robe of honor, and give him my ring. Now, what was significant about the ring? Well, back in these times, the ring that he's talking about was likely a signet ring, which you pour wax on an envelope and seal it up and push the imprint of the ring in it, therefore making it um, an official document for that family. When he handed the son the ring, the son was completely reinstated as heir. And once again, everything the father had owned was given to the son. Kill the fattened calf. Let's celebrate because the son of mine that was lost is now found. The son of mine that was dead is alive. It's not a story about the son. It never was intended to be a story about the son. It's a story about this, this recklessness, this love that we can't fathom, and a constantly searching father, a father who would do anything, like give his only son to the children he loves more than life itself. That's what the story's about, and it seems a bit reckless. One more story for you. Um, this one's about Peter, and Peter shows up in the New Testament often. Um, Peter was a person who knew the law. He knew um, what, what the rules were, what to eat and what not to eat, and how to behave and where to go and all of that. Um, and we know the story when Peter was with Jesus and that he was, he was a little bit reckless at, in the real sense of the term. Um, he, he was always ready to just run forward and do something for Jesus, and um, Jesus had to bring him in at times. And then, recklessly, he also denied Jesus three times on the night of his crucifixion. And Jesus reinstated him when he was resurrected and before he went back to heaven. But the story I wanted to share with you comes in Acts 10 and 11. Um, I highly recommend looking at it because it's one of those times in the Bible where God takes his own rule and he comes to Peter in such a personal way and he says, I'm going to change this now. <laughs> Talk about confusing. So he comes to Peter uh, in a vision and the vision is of animals of all kinds on what's described as a sheet coming down. Um, and Peter hears the voice that he knew in life. He knew Jesus. It says, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter is like, um, no, because these are unclean animals. And in Leviticus 11, um, the law is very explicit about which animals are clean and which are unclean. And it, it, it gives criteria, but then it also goes so far as to give several examples of, okay, this one meets one criteria, but not the other, so unclean. <laughs> so it's very clear. And Peter knew that. And yet what God was trying to do was get people's head wrapped around the new covenant, which meant it's no longer necessary to go through all these steps to come to me because of what Jeremiah talked about last week. Because of Jesus, he was the sacrifice. 
So no longer do we have to obey all of these very specific laws. But Peter had lived most of his life under those laws. And so for him, this was not something he took lightly. So in Acts chapter 10, God reassures him multiple times. I, it's me, <laughs> it's me. He gives him the vision three or four different times. And then he sends people from Cornelius's house who come and say, hey, we're, we're here for you and we're not really sure why. <laughs> And God had, God said, these are the guys I sent. So Peter is just, his mind is just exploding. Peter walked with Jesus for three years in the flesh, and now he was going to change things. Stories like this, I'm not saying, neither of us would ever say, you get a vision, and it's contrary to God's word, go do it. No, that is not at all what we're saying at all, but that God reassured him through the Spirit in so many different ways, that this is me. And then he went to the home of Cornelius, who was a Gentile, and spoke the word. Cornelius was obeying God the best he knew how, but he didn't really know what he was doing. So Peter went, shared, straightened things out for him. Cornelius' family is baptized. Many are baptized. And the world went, now what? Because these are not Jewish people. The the sudden logic that God would come to a people that were never his own was counterintuitive to everything that Peter had ever known and learned. So now we have not only the, the making all food clean, but go and dine with someone who's a Gentile believer. Had to be completely impractical. And so it makes you wonder a little bit the question that we were addressing is, is, what if we don't really understand what God is up to at times? What if we don't really have this, this big picture? And that, that's the, the gift of the Holy Spirit within us and the asking for wisdom and the seeking clarification. How can that be done if we're not in His Word? If we're not seeking His face and taking time in our prayer, um, to find out who he is and what he's up to, to live in this community of believers, I think, is all part of that. And so part of what I want to talk about are just some practical tools. How many of you are like me where digging into a book of the Bible is difficult? It's, it's a stretch for me just to, just to dive in and read it and go, yeah, I get all that. that that's not a real thing for a lot of us. So there are tools out there that can help. Um, one of the greatest tools is simply the prayer. Lord, here I am with this book on my lap. I've got your word in front of me, God, and I want it. Lord, I desire your wisdom. Lord God, speak to me through your Holy Spirit and empower me, God. And there's plenty of examples of Paul praying this all through the letters in the New Testament, not only for himself, but for us. And so we're going to share that a little bit today. But if you're like me and you struggle to read Scripture and it doesn't make sense, number one, try a different translation. Try a, a version of the Bible that speaks to you. Um, I sort of grew up in the faith from about age 18, um, and I'm hopefully still growing today, but uh, I, I'd never even opened a Bible until I sat in her stepdad's church going, I'm going to be washed in what? Boy, that doesn't make a lot of sense. That's kind of gross, washed in the blood. Wow. Um, so it, it, was, it was a shock for me. And the last year and a half, two years, I've so enjoyed and engrossed myself in reading this, this simple little version of the Bible, the Amplified. And I've talked about it multiple times, and I'm not saying that any of you should try it. I don't even necessarily recommend it, but it speaks to my heart. I can dig in and I can, I can get the words in there that are big. One of the tools that I've put on my telephone in the last two years is a Bible concordance. I've got a folder I call church, and in there is this app called Strong's Concordance. 
I'm, I'm, a, I'm a word nerd, I guess. I kind of like to know, hey, when this was written, what did it really mean? Because, you know, things get lost in translation. So having a, a Bible concordance can be an awesome tool. If you don't know how to use it, I'll, I'd love to sit with you and show you because it's super neat. The other thing that helps um, me to stay engaged in the Word um, is just a daily devotion. There's about what, Matt, a dozen of us now, maybe more in this congregation that read the same devotional book every day. And so we've sort of got two groups of guys going, reading the same devotion every day, and we, we text message back and forth. And usually someone sends a picture out each day. The devotion is great, right? But that's, that's not really what it's about. It's about the accountability that we have to each other. It's about staying involved and staying engaged. It's about encouraging one another. It's, it's sending a goofy meme to Kevin Tweeten because if you know Kevin, it makes sense, right? It's, it's, it's the love, the accountability, and the closeness we have with each other to keep digging every day. That's a tool. If you don't have that, we'd love to get you plugged into um, because you can understand there is nothing in God's Word that is too deep for you to swim through. And there's nothing in His Word that's too shallow for you to just skip over. Because our God can use this book and His Holy Spirit to empower things in you that you're not even aware of. But that fellowship with others can help you stay accountable to do that. And then I'll just kind of, I guess we'll sort of finish this up and We've got just a little bit left, but I wanted to just talk to you about uh, some scriptures that specifically say the Holy Spirit will teach you. And so if you feel inadequate to open the Bible and understand, you are. <laughs> there, we've said it. <laughs> it's fine. We all are. I mean, this is, um, in, is it First Corinthians or First Corinthians 2.14? This stuff is spiritually discerned. It can't be understood without the Holy Spirit. So don't feel dumb. Feel normal. And then ask God to speak to you through his Holy Spirit and point you towards the book, point you toward the chapter, the verse, whatever, wherever he would have you. And then trust, trust yourself. If you, if you feel led to read something, you don't have to second guess that. What do you have to lose? Go there. See what you see. And I bet something will jump off the page. But... Um, two scriptures you can jot them down or you can just file them away in your memory john 14 26 says the comforter which is the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name jesus is saying this will teach you all things and will bring all things to your remembrance so you may read something and it makes no sense to you at all and you feel like it's just bouncing off your brain and then a week or two later, you're in a situation and that scripture just comes back to your mind because you put it in, you had the faith, you opened your Bible as an act of faith and God through the Holy Spirit will do that work and you'll be amazed. Um, Proverbs 123 says, behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. There's a, there's a lot of those promises in the Bible that it, it's a spiritual thing. So if you feel like it's not going very well, as Jeremiah said, there's lots of approaches, but I think the easiest and the, probably the one you could just do on your own with your Bible on your lap is just, God, I don't know what I'm doing, but I want to know you. And he wants you to know him. So he will reveal himself to you in his word. So I think we just wanted to close this up um, the same way Jeremiah closed last week, which was that idea of being rooted and grounded in love out of Ephesians chapter 3. So we're going to take turns on this. Yeah. So I'll be reading from the Amplified, and you'll be reading from the New King James. Yep. She's a bigger word nerd than I am, in case you're wondering. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to start in verse 10. So Paul writes, and he says, so now... Through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God in all of its countless aspects might be made known to you, revealing the mystery to the rulers and authorities in all of the heavenly places. 
And this is in accordance with the terms of the eternal purpose which God carried out in Jesus Christ our Lord. In whom, this is the important part today, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. That is, our faith gives us sufficient courage to freely and openly approach God through Christ. That's a new thing. And so he picks it up from there. Um, I'm starting in verse 16. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in your inner person. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Remember, you're going to open your Bible in faith. Even if you don't know what you're doing. You're just going to open it in faith. And that spirit comes in that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. So as you are reading, as you open his word and spend time with him daily, you become rooted. rooted growing roots is not an easy business. Like, if you think about what plants have to go through pushing their way through soil, that is tough stuff. But then when the roots are grown, think about what that plant is able to do, right? So think about that in terms of you. When you are taking the test is not the time to realize, oh my gosh, I need answers, <laughs> right? I mean, we've all been in that position before. And it is not wrong to open your Bible when you are in the crisis. Of course it's not. That's a great time to open your Bible. How much better if the Holy Spirit is able to bring things back to your remembrance that you've already put in day by day, growing those roots so that when the tough stuff comes, you're not, you might be rocked, but you're not destroyed. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the people around you look at you and they say, how is she doing that? And then they ask you. And then you say, well, right? I mean, there's so many great things that come from opening your Bible day after day. Oswald Chambers, in My Utmost for His Highest, writes that trying to do this in the moment is like trying to build the weapons of war while in the trenches. What we're proposing to you is a radical shift where you, you invest. And you take this investment in time, this investment in effort, this investment in prayer and devotion to our Lord, and you store it up. And you wait. And you see what he's going to do with that. And in Ephesians 3.20, Paul says this, Now to him who is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly more than all we could dare to ask or think, infinitely beyond our greatest prayers, beyond our hopes and our dreams, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So we're going to be available. Carrie and Rick will be available. If you want prayer today, or just a hug, just someone to be near, please come. We would love to spend a minute with you.